Hello viewers, welcome to this particular lecture on phloem sap, its composition and flow. In this particular lecture, I shall be talking about the different components of phloem sap and I, I shall also be talking about the flow in which it occurs, their importance and of course I will be ending with the different girdling experiments and the phloem loading and unloading. So to start with, the major constituents of phloem sap are carbohydrate, protein, enzymes, minerals, growth hormone and organic acid. And if we consider the percentage, the carbohydrate or sugar percentage is more than 80%, amino acids around 5.2, organic acid around 2, protein around 1.5 to 2, potassium is around 2 to 4, but the chloride, phosphate and magnesium they are very less in trace amount, less than 1%. Of course, the carbohydrate that we normally get in phloem, they are all non-reducing sugar and reducing sugar such as glucose, they are chemically so much reactive that they cannot be transported through phloem. So the most common form of sugar that is transported through phloem of plant is sucrose. And it is said that this particular sucrose is transported along the sieve tube in such a way that there is a concentration gradient from negative to positive gradient. And in the positive gradient, that particular sieve plate will have an excess of potassium ion as a result of which it is positive. And at that point, ATP expenditure is done and the phloem will get the sugar concentration higher than the next one and it will cross the sieve plate to get into the next particular sieve tube. So sucrose, though it is the most common form of sugar, there may be some other forms of carbohydrate like glucose, mannitol, raffinose, tachyose, etc. Considering the different forms of protein, protein may be in different forms like in the families of cucurbitaceae, in the family of euphorbiaceae, there are different forms. Chitin binding lectin is the most important anti-nutritional properties and it is also called anti-protein. Apart from that, there are glutathione reductase or aspartate protease or trypsin, chymotrypsin, PP1, callosynthase, superoxide dismutase, ACC oxidase, and they are having different growth, plugging, or other hormonal activity. At the same time, there may be anexine and calmodulin, which is mainly helping in the healing of wound of plant body. Also, there is another unique type of protein, which is commonly called STEP. What is STEP? STEP is sieve tube exuded protein. And this particular group of protein can be classified into three major types. Number one is enzymes, which are mostly helping in the metabolism of sugar and in the form of amylase. Apart from that, there are structural protein, which is P protein. They are crystalline or amorphous and helping in the transport of sugar across the sieve tube. And the third one is the maintenance protein, which is including the glutaredoxin, cystatin, ubiquitin, etc., which mainly help in the maintenance of normal structure and function of sieve tube. When we consider the phloem protein pattern, we will see in that particular phloem, mostly the molecular weight of protein is around 20 to 24 in the sieve tube accident. And in general, the phloem protein is lesser than the hypocotyl or in the overall seedling. Considering the different amino acids, all the 20 amino acids are present, but some of the amino acids are higher in amount, which include glutamine or glutamic acid, followed by asparagine. Whereas the others, they are relatively less and moderate, that is aspartic acid, or sometimes it is serine, which are moderate in amount. Now, when we consider the rate of phloem transfer, the specific mass transfer is actually a ratio. Ratio of the transfer of dry matter per unit time divided by the cross-sectional area of the phloem. So, we can consider that the mass transfer per unit area is the concentration of the sap multiplied by the speed of flow. Now, there are different methods by which the phloem sap can be analyzed. That include the incision. When we give an incision in the phloem, the exudate will come out and straight away chemically we can determine what is the composition. Apart from that, there is EDTA, that is ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid, which is a chelating agent and it will chelate the different components of phloem and by analyzing that, we know what is exactly present in the phloem. The third method is GCMS, 
this particular method actually we are using some typical solvent which is volatilized and the components can easily be determined. The fourth method is stylectomy method. What is that? The insect normally feeds on the phloem sap. So if we cut off the style or cut off the stylet, then that particular stylet will have the exact composition of the phloem which can be taken in a capillary tube and chemically analyzed to know the exact composition of the phloem sap. Of course, phloem sap may vary. As in case of rice plant, we have seen that though sucrose is the major component, but there can be amino acids or potassium varying then in comparison to other plant. Not only that, the concentration of sucrose or other components like potassium is higher in the internode than that of the leaf sheath. So there is slight variation of phloem sap sugar and other nutrients in between the plant body. Similarly, glutamic acid or glutamine may be higher in the phloem sap in comparison to the leaf sheath or other component. In case of citrus, citrus fruit like orange, pears, etc., this particular citrus fruit, in fact, include the sucrose, which is the main sugar. And apart from sugar, there may be raffinose or polyol, like mannitol and sorbitol. Apart from that, this particular phloem protein and phloem sugar will welcome different insects. And when these insects are feeding on the phloem sap, there will be infection of certain other pathogen, which include the citrus tristeza virus, or sometimes it can be spiroplasma infection, or sometimes it can be candidatus infection, and which is basically transmitted through these insects. So what happens is, because the phloem sap is nutritious, and the insect knows that this particular phloem sap is nutritious for them, it is their food, they will invade the phloem. As a matter of fact, while invading, some other pathogenic organism will be set free into the plant, and the plant will show clear stages of infection. But at the same time, when there is elevated carbon dioxide concentration, there will be some impact on stomatal aperture and water potential will actually go up. And at this point of time, the aphids will feed on the phloem sap. And because of this feeding, there will be some chemical change. And this chemical change will bring about some sort of defense, as noted in Meticago Trancutella. A unique formula is there, which is called Briggs value. Actually, it is the estimation of soluble solid content of pure sap obtained by centrifugation. And it can be as high as 9 to 10, but for citrus juice, the Briggs value is 5.4 to 10. And this particular Briggs value in phloem sap in grapevine is 4.5 to 24. Basically, it is an indication of soluble sugar and protein present in phloem sap. When we consider the different composition of phloem amino acids, we will see there can be different methods, different methods using different solvent. They are termed as MTBS TFA or EDTA, or sometimes it is MCF, or sometimes it is combination of the two. What we see is there is no basic change. That is, if a particular amino acid is proline, then more or less that proline will be the major amino acid, whatever method we can adopt. But this proline will be followed by others, and as the concentration of one particular amino acid goes down, we gradually see that there is more variation. So what does it mean? Irrespective of the method of detecting higher amount of amino acid change minutely, but the basic component remains the same. In case of organic acids also, we find the same thing. We find that malic acid is the major component, though sometimes this malic acid is going up and down or replaced by fumaric acid when there is a different method like the MTBS TFA. And this is normally found in sweet orange. So what does it mean? It again means that organic acids also vary from plant to plant depending upon the method of extraction or estimation. In the same way, the sugar concentration, you also see that irrespective of method, mostly that is TMS or EDTA, sucrose concentration is the highest phloem sugar and the others are less than that. As I have already told you, phloem is a very important food for different insects, like the aphids which belong to 
hemiptera, that is true bug, they feed on this particular phloem sap. For this purpose, they have a stylet with which they actually board the plant and they feed on the sap. And when we cut the stylet, as I told you, there will be particular phloem sap concentration present in the stylet which we can measure. And as we separate out the effete from the piercing plant body, then there the phloem sap ooze out from that particular tissue. Apart from insect feed, phloem sap can be used for making different nutritious or other nutritional juice that include the maple syrup. The famous maple syrup is actually the phloem sap. It includes riboflavin, thiamine, manganese, zinc, magnesium, calcium, iron, selenium and potassium and it has got very high calorie. Similarly, it can also be used in the manufacture of birch syrup and birch syrup actually is containing glucose and fructose and there will be some organic acid present and there will be some more salt in the form of potassium, calcium and magnesium and the color or flavor changes with this concentration. The third one here is wild palm syrup. Palm syrup also contains sugar, very high amount of sugar. The reducing sugar is more. There will be also high amount of potassium followed by other elements like magnesium, phosphorus, sodium, calcium, iron, copper, zinc. And there is also some phenolic content of this phloem sap. But what does it indicate? That this particular syrup produced from phloem sap can be highly nutritious and at the same time it can be highly tasty. It is a delicacy in many countries. Now a very interesting point, it was shown in Arabic Dopsis thaliana that this particular phloem is attacked by some insect. As a result of which there will be some mechanical injury and this mechanical injury will elicit different pathways which include the salicylic acid signaling pathway or the jasmonic acid pathway. Because of that, this particular plant will show some chemical change and this chemical change will make the plant resistant against future pathogen attack and which is sometimes called induced systemic resistance. Now there are different ways by which we can see that there will be cellular change when there is a particular aphid damaging. So whenever the aphid is damaging, there will be change in chlorophyll. And this chlorophyll will be damaged as a result of which the plant will show chlorosis. But because of chlorosis, what happens is there will be definite production of ROS and the ROS induced damage is clearly observed in the plant body. But gradually, it is the nature of the plant which will recover from this mechanical injury and it will come back to normal. So at a later time, what we see that the damage which is caused by the deposition of phenolic, making those areas brown, will again become yellow and again gradually become green. So what does it indicate? It indicates that whenever there is a damage in the plant body because of the feeding habit of the aphid, initially there will be some change but gradually the plant will come back to normal and the normal physiological functioning will be followed. Now what happens is during this particular phloem movement there will be co-propagation of reactive oxygen species and calcium and electric wave and it will be gradually moving across the phloem sieve tube. What we see is when definitely there is change in the particular ROS generation and this ROS generation will produce definite amount of calcium and because of this calcium level there will be alternating levels of ROS and APX1 as a result of which there will be accumulation of jasmonic acid or jasmonate and which will make the plant systemically resistant. Resistant against pathogen like fungi and bacteria. As I was telling you that there are some unique protein components in phloem sap they are called antiprotein. That is, they are antagonizing protein activity. And this antiprotein may be present in soybean, potato, and other plant. They are mostly heat labile, that is, at high temperature they are destroyed. But this particular protease inhibitor, what they do is the normal protein activity or protein degrading activity is reduced. And the plant can actually remain unchanged for a longer period. So this antiprotein is giving some sort of youthfulness to the plant body. Plant lectin is a very important constituent of phloem. Plant lectin play 
a vital self-defending role by deleteriously affecting the growth of insect and hindering their oviposition or reproductive behavior. Expression of lectin is sensitive to stress and there will be plant stress like wounding, salt stress and thereby more lectin produced will make the plant resistant to this particular stress. Say for example, the tobacco leaves which normally has very low level of lectin but when treated with jasmonate, now jasmonate is not normally produced. Jasmonate be produced whenever the insect is feeding the plant. There will be more lectin expression and somewhat the plant become resistant against excess stress. Plant lectin may be also involved in plant and soil bacteria maintaining a symbiotic relationship. What does it mean? That specific plant will accumulate some amount of lectin on their surface which will attract friendly bacteria like the nitrogen fixing rhizobium coming to the root of leguminous plant and producing the root nodule which will ultimately help in nitrogen fixation. Now let us talk about girdling. Basically girdling is a phenomenon where we are removing the outer part of the stem in the form of a girdle. And this girdling is normal girdling where just a ring like outer part is removed as a result of which the upper part becomes thick and there will be accumulation of phloem sap. So there might be some rooting at that point. Sometimes girdling is artificially induced by mechanical process and this is called sincturing in orchard or in vine plants where there is girdling carried out with a heavy wear as a result of which this particular plant will show some girdling stress and this girdling stress will ultimately have blockage and there will be accumulation of juice at that point. It is normally used for making the plant propagate artificially. Sometimes the girdling may be accidental. As I was telling you that accidental girdling will be caused by say tying a tight rope just around the stem will cause a natural girdle. Sometimes girdling is carried out in grape to make it nutritionally more active and sometimes insect feeding pattern also create girdling because the girdling is the insect is feeding like a ring and this ring will be created by insect feeding so it is called insect induced girdling. Now when we consider the flow of sugar which is in the form of sucrose basically there is a specific way by which it is moving and this movement is denoted by H plus ion gradient. I was telling you previously that this proton gradient is basically brought about by uniport mechanism by which H plus ion is moving out and as it moves out there is a co-transporter protein which is also transporting sucrose. So basically that particular apoplast having the sucrose and the proton will follow the simple plasma membrane co-transporter and will be getting into the cytoplasm or symplast and there will be sympoter type of movement. When we consider the phloem movement, they are mostly of two types, apoplastic and symplastic. We call it loading because there will be loading of sugar at the point where it is produced and unloading will be taking place in that particular point where it is utilized. So we call it a source sink mechanism. So we know that apoplastic loading of sucrose is common but in symplastic way sucrose and other oligosaccharide may be followed. Now the companion cells that normally help in apoplastic loading is transfer cell but for symplastic loading it is intermediary cell and usually the plasmodesmata connection for apoplastic loading will be less but for symplastic loading it is more because the transport is taking place through cytoplasmic connection across the plasmodesmata. A very interesting point is the phloem loading mechanism. This phloem loading mechanism is actually helped by gibberellin and particular sucrose is produced inside the leaf and the sucrose will be binding with phosphate because of the sucrose phosphate synthase and it get into the sieve tube or it may come into the companion cell and in the companion cell there will be gradually transported and this transporter protein will help in conversion of using extracellular infartase where sucrose is converted to glucose and fructose and this glucose is utilized. So what we see is 
hormone mediated transport across the sieve tube and finally activation of specific enzyme in the form of extracellular invertase which will convert this particular sucrose into glucose and fructose and this hexose molecule is utilized in the sink or in the root. And this process is definitely helped by continuous photosynthesis in the leaf which will generate more sugar in the leaf in comparison to the root. Now there are different ways by which phloem loading and unloading takes place. The two modes of phloem loading strategies are apoplasmic loading and symplasmic loading as I told you. In case of active membrane transport in apoplasmic loading, sucrose is transported from mesophyll cells to the top cell symplastically and effluxed into the apoplasm where it is usually co-transported along with proton via proton pump. The second mechanism is the polymer trap mechanism. Here what happens is the sucrose is symplasmically transported into the intermediary cell or we call it middle cell where there will be polymerization of sucrose binding with raffinose and stachyose that is the formation of three sugar together will be symplasmically transported and the backflow is prevented because of the smaller orifice so naturally the bigger molecule cannot come back. So it is unidirectional flow though we know that phloem is having both upward and downward or lateral flow. In the third way that is commonly called the passive or alternative symplasmic loading here the transport of sucrose is driven via a concentration gradient and mostly the unloading is symplasmic following the concentration gradient that means wherever the sucrose will be higher that is in the sieve tube higher sucrose is there it will be transported or unloaded in the sink where less sucrose is present. But sometimes what happens is this particular SECC complex is symplasmically isolated. An active step of apoplastic unloading takes place where sucrose is retrieved. This is commonly observed in maternal or filial interface where assimilates leave the maternal symplasm and taken up by the filial tissue. So what we actually see is different ways of phloem loading and unloading depending upon the exact composition of the phloem sap. So what I have tried to discuss is the different phloem composition that is the presence of sugar in different forms, presence of protein, presence of step or different enzymes. I have also discussed what are the different methods by which this phloem sap can be analyzed. Definitely I have discussed the importance of this particular phloem sap making commercially important material like different juices. I have also discussed that this phloem sap can act as a food for insects and this insect food will definitely allow the insects to attack the plant and feed on the phloem sap. And as there is some mechanical injury, there will be an internal change followed by the accumulation of jasmonic acid or salicylic acid which will make the plant resistant, resistant against future infection. And in the same way I have also discussed the different forms of girdling, how it is carried out, either it is natural or artificial and what is its importance. In this way, the balance of sugar is maintained between the leaf that is the source and the sink that is the root of a plant body. Thank you.